Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Kashif Noor. I'm the regional head for Nedbank Wealth Management SA. While we are connecting with you online in this way, it is important to reflect on connectivity and connections in general, but especially when it comes to our money and financial matters. At Nedbank Private Wealth and Nedbank Financial Planning, we use our globally integrated and advice-led <clears throat> approach to connect your financial decisions to your goals and aspirations. The reality is that every single financial decision we make affects our ability to, number one, protect what is important to us, and two, achieve our goals and dreams. At Nedbank Private Wealth and Nedbank Financial Planning, we make these connections more visible and therefore more manageable. We connect you to technical expertise, a global perspective, appropriate opportunities, and access to solutions and services from across Nedbank and other top providers. But most importantly, we connect you to the personal and objective advice that you need to make your money decisions count. In today's webinar about the South African property market, we are delighted to be listening to a panel of experts in the property industry. Will be facilitated by multi management investment analyst from NED Group Investments, Tomisha Greater. A little, about, a little bit about Tomisha. She has a background in economics and has worked as a television anchor at CNBC Africa, as well as an economic strategist at Novara Actuaries and Consultants. Our panel of speakers will share their insight on the recovery of the property market in our country and further explain the factors to which this recovery is owed. With this recovery comes opportunities to make our money work for us. We can all agree that with every investment opportunity comes risks. And as markets fluctuate, so do these investment risks. Parallel to sharing current property investment opportunities, our speakers will enlighten us on how to navigate these property risks. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce our panel of experts. Fuyiswa Ramakova is an experienced CEO, entrepreneur, and non-executive director. Until recently, she held the position of Chief Executive Officer at the South African Institute of Black Property Practitioners. She's also the chairperson of the National Property Practitioners Council, one of the largest property sector industry council in SA. Our next speaker, Gemma Moore, is a director at Deleu Valuers. Gemma studied her BSc Honours Property Studies at the University of Cape Town. Since graduating, Gemma had been involved in the property valuations industry. Deleu Valuers are a national property valuation firm undertaking property valuations for a variety of purposes and varying asset classes, with a special interest in hospitality valuations. Last but certainly not least, we have Hayley Ivans Downs who is Head of Digital at Lightstone. Haley's core focus is creating a customer-centric digital experience. She has over two and a half decades of experience and leads a dedicated team to find bespoke solutions that address Lightstone's clients' precise needs. Over to housekeeping. Please use the Q&A chat box on the left-hand side to submit a question during the webinar. Whilst we may not get to all of the questions, we will be having a follow-up session where we look and aim to address a lot of these questions, but more details to follow. If your screen does happen to freeze, ladies and gentlemen, during the webinar, please click the refresh button and it should take you back to where you stopped last in the webinar. You will receive an email in the next few days with a link to a recording of the webinar in case you would like to share this and watch it again. Please remember you can get more Thought Leadership Insights, recordings of previous webinars, and find out about future webinars on our website. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Tamisha Greater. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Kashif. Thanks for the great introductions um, and the warm welcome. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic definitely defied almost every economic prediction. Uh, in March 2020, we saw stores, restaurants and offices empty out with astonishing swiftness, 
we saw the stock market tank and jobs quickly disappeared. Now, if we fast forward two years on, we find ourselves in a still, still weak, uh, albeit improved economy with rising interest rates. Uh, and today, it is my absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to engage with our industry experts who will be able to share their perspectives on what we can expect from the local property market from here onwards. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for making the time to join us. So I'm going to kick off with you, Hayley, um, looking at the residential sector. Maybe if you can give us the lay of the land in terms of what you've seen over the last two years or so. Um, have you seen any material changes when the lockdown restrictions were relaxed over the last six months? Uh, maybe just give us a sense of you know, how the residential property market has actually fared. Thank you, Chimi, and thank you, Nedbank, for this great opportunity. I think it's always good just to revisit in terms of where we are in the landscape of residential property. I think firstly, just to establish what that landscape looks like, we're sitting with 6.9 million registered properties in South Africa with a value of over 6.4 trillion if we look at the, the value of all of those registered properties. And just looking at the type of properties, just to give a view of landscape, 81% of those are freehold, and by freehold we mean single dwellings, houses, standing on their own, versus estates, 7%, sectional title, 12%. It's been really interesting looking at how the property market has fared through the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. It's certainly not what we expected, and the property market has actually rallied. We've had a really good property market. It's been really active. Um, we've seen prices holding, we've seen sales increasing, we've had banks increase in lending, we've seen interest rates last year that were at their lowest in decades, literally 50 years. Um, we were looking back in uh, 1972, 1973 was a similar interest rate to what we are now. So it's certainly a phase where it really encourages people to purchase properties as opposed to renting which really obviously buoyed the property market and really great for, for the sales that was happening. Something else that we've picked up in the last two years was this year in January, the building plans passed was the highest in two years on flats and townhouses, which is also a great indication for economy uh, that gives a view in terms of new properties being built um, and some further increase in terms of properties kind of being bought as well. Just around normal house price inflation that we've seen year on year, it really was kind of at a peak around 2021 quarter two. We saw an increase there for the luxury market at about 5%. We saw kind of an increase overall on about 6%, which is really great, ending on about 4% in 2021. Um, active market, the areas of demand were obviously in areas where it's all around location. Estates is a preferred option in terms of purchasing of properties. We're actually seeing a lack of stock in many of the areas that are sought after, specifically in estates. We're seeing prices that are holding. Um, it's going to be interesting looking at econ economic factors coming through over the next year or so, but I'll get into that a bit more detail. Just around kind of provinces, also a view around provinces in terms of where we saw prices holding. Um, Northern Cape, we had price inflation of 8%, which is really quite high, so that's really great. Then we saw kind of Gauteng 6%, KZN was a bit lower, 5%, your Western Cape is 7%. And another interesting fact is that 60% of properties are all bonded. So another kind of information piece, I think we also forget the 40% that is cash based, also quite a high percentage. The banks are obviously lending, um, and it's been a really good phase for the banks. Um, some of the banks are even lending up to 105%, which is, once again, times that are really good and buoyant for the property market. I think the transfers, just to give a view in terms of number of transfers, number of transfers that happened this year, um, we kind of up to 240,000 of 2021. And in comparison, we saw those numbers last in 2008. So we've actually seen a really excited property market after the pandemic. And I think a number of factors that kind of contributed to those changes. Uh, we, lockdown rules had no effect. We didn't see lockdown rules as an effect on property market, which was interesting. We actually saw that people were working more from home, um, which is also 
an indication where people had a view where you can work anywhere, not just required in an office. So it became a, a kind of a lead into your semigration, but we saw people getting the opportunity to buy elsewhere and not having to work where their offices are, which obviously also created a lot of movement within the property market. Um, and then once again, just reaffirm that price, prices are still holding. We are seeing that prop properties are attaining prices that are being asked for. Um, there are areas that are low in stock and still slightly active. We are picking up, I think it's a winter and an interest rate difference um, that's now triggered, but there is a slowness starting to happen at the moment, but it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Well, Hayley, thank you so much for uh, giving us, you know, that, that lay of the land in terms of what we're seeing in the residential sector. Uh, quite interesting to see that, you know, that that sector is, is holding uh, is holding up quite strongly. Uh, Gemma, let me move on to you. I mean, we, we have an idea now of what's happening in the residential sector. Perhaps maybe you can come in uh, and give us a sense of what you've been seeing in the commercial or industrial space. Um, you know, what have been some of the the you know, the trends in terms of pricing, new trends, supply and demand dynamics, et cetera. Um, so we've observed that the effect on the commercial and the industrial sectors has been quite different between the two. So firstly, um, for the commercial sector, uh, COVID did accelerate the adoption of remote working by traditional office users. And this has resulted in sort of long-term commercial demand and often smaller spaces are needed. This isn't necessarily reactive, but rather in newly entrenched. But then on the flip side of this, of remote working, is that many office users are seeing the benefits of being in an office. Skills transfer, culture building, collaboration and knowledge sharing are not the same on a virtual platform. So we have seen this firsthand in our business, that skills transfers with juniors happens far, at a far quicker pace in person. And then ultimately people do need some kind of human interaction in some form. So a hybrid model is becoming more prevalent and we're seeing that um, quite a lot at the moment. Um, in my view, the eight to five, five days a week approach has changed. Um, people appreciate the flexibility and have seen the advantages and disadvantages on both sides of the spectrum. Traffic and commuting times are a consideration too, but saying that there are, certain there are still certain roles which require employees to be in an office. And then in terms of office rentals, these are under pressure and we have seen many rental reversions. A grade offices and certain nodes are doing better, whilst B and C grade offices are struggling. There seems to be sort of rental creep and users can now afford to essentially jump into the next grade, um, putting pressure on the lower graded properties. There's increased demand for smaller units and often in outlying areas. And then lease periods are also tending to be shorter um, with the trend being observed of three to five years rather than the long 10 year leases. And then in many instances, large tenant installation allowances and rent free periods are being offered by landlords just to fill the space and attract tenants. Then moving on to the industrial sector, it's been widely, widely publicized that this sector has been more resilient over the past two years and demand remains strong in certain nodes where fundamental demand drivers exist, such as location, accessibility, connectivity, and then obviously the property um, specific attributes are also important. Then generally rentals in the industrial space haven't decreased as much, but have rather moved sideways. There have been a few rental reversions in some nodes um, where longer term leases may have escalated above market over time. Then logistics remain strong and there's good demand. However, these are often the newer purpose built properties where the rental is a function of a return on the development cost. So it'll be interesting to see what unfolds in the coming months. Uh, certainly uh, looking forward to uh, our discussion, you know, continue this discussion a bit more just to look at future trends. But before uh, we do that, we, so let me bring you into the conversation. Uh, as Hayley was saying right in the beginning, you know, she discussed uh, very briefly around interest rates and the fact that uh, obviously the residential property market has benefited from this. Uh, now we are in a rising inflation uh, you know, environment. We are seeing higher interest rates. And of course, you know, the, the pandemic will 
will continue to be a, a, critical, uh, you know, a critical factor that is likely to still influence the South African property market in 2022. Is this something that you would agree with? Uh, maybe give us a sense of how you are reading uh, the property market uh, for this year in South Africa. Thanks, Dewey. And um, firstly, two things. I'd just like to say it's nice to see a, a panel of ladies um, speaking today, and that's very encouraging to see that uh, the faces are changing in our industry. And uh, secondly, happy Africa Day to everybody who is on the call today. Um, so, I mean, yes, I think I think we've all kind of uh, watched the interest rates. Uh, you know, I'd say um, the roller coaster ride that the interest rates have been on in the last couple uh, years, in the last sort of eighteen months. Um, Haley touched on it in her opening, and, and certainly there's an impact on this in the commercial sector as well. It have, obviously has a direct impact on the cost of funding and therefore the ability to repay, repay down debt. Um, this has a direct impact on LTVs, um, and, and that you know obviously impacts the profile and attractiveness of an investment. So, I mean, I mean just looking specifically at some of the listed REITs, um, you know, this was a big focus area in the last 18 months. It was about um, managing those LTVs and making sure that um, you know people are able to control that aspect. Um, but I think also the other aspect that is unavoidable in our country is the question about um, socioeconomic stability. Uh, we saw the impact of the KZN riots last year, um, and that obviously also reverberated throughout the sector. And I think it's you know these are things that uh, investors who are now looking at the commercial sector need to need to also be aware of. It's, it's you know, rentals and, and kind of the, the traditional uh, methods of assessing investments are key, you know, rental income, LTVs, et cetera. But there are lots of other external factors that also now impact, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate return or, or, or risk profile of an investment. Um, ESG is also something that's coming into sharp focus and it impacts the ability of certain funds to attract capital and it also impacts pricing in some instances. So, you know, from an investor lens, that's also something that um, investors need to be aware of and they need to be looking at the, the ESG kind of profiles of companies that they are investing in because this has a direct impact on, on the company's kind of risk management strategy and long-term growth and sustainability strategy. And it speaks to things like, you know, the energy and waste management, cost management, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, um, certainly also uh, an impact on the cost of funding um, going forward. So, I mean, the, the recent interest rate hikes, um, you know, obviously do have an impact. As I said, they impact the cost of funding, but I think, the, the overarching message around around property is is you know don't panic, um, wait out the storm. Uh, interest rates are cyclical by nature, uh, by design. Uh, you know we had the lowest interest rates in the last 25 years just recently, and even though we've recently had a hike, we're nowhere near where we were 15 to 20 years ago. So you know I think the the key thing is for investors to take a sober approach and a, and a long term approach. To, to assessing to assessing uh, 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 property investments and to assessing the the risk profile of property investments, it's not about taking those uh, knee jerk reactions. Um, and then I think Gemma actually touched on a lot of the areas that I that I was going to just reference in terms of where the kind of um, pockets of opportunity and excellence are in the industry. She's mentioned um, logistics being an area that has been quite a firm favorite for for the for the recent period. Um, Student accommodation is also in high demand. You know, we know that um, at a national level, there's still a high demand for student accommodation. And I think those companies that are getting it right are, are, are seeing some green shoots there. There's also some new sectors around um, healthcare sector, uh, healthcare property. And I mean, that's that's an area that I think people are also now starting to become aware of. And, and it's, a, it's a growing part of our sector. And of course, not forgetting just residential in, in general. So, um, We've had a tough, we've had a bit of a tough run for the last uh, 18 to 24 months, possibly more, but there are a lot of green shoots and it's certain, certainly still a sector where um, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, thanks. We, um, 
Hayley, let me come back to you. Um, you mentioned uh, the word semigration in the beginning, and you know, mm -hmm. as has said it's been a, a tough, say, 24 months, and some people have tried to make their lives a little bit easier, moving away uh, from the congested uh, areas or away from the concrete jungle, um, and then you know, wanting to to be in areas where they they think what well, they would have a, a better quality of life. I speak being a, a perhaps a, a semigrant myself. Um, um, maybe talk to us a little bit about this particular phenomenon. Is this something that, you know, that was uh, uh, intensified on the back of the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Is this something that's likely to uh, to happen? Maybe just tell us a little bit about, uh, about this. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I think just around immigration, it's probably always good just to get the definition as well. Um, and on the Lightstone side, we see, see semigration as when a buyer sells a property and purchases a new one and moves to a new province. So that's essentially what we classify as the semigration definition, is literally moving provinces. Um, and I think it's quite important also to note that this is something that's ongoing as a general trend within property, but we did find an uptick after the COVID pandemic it moved from about a 38% people semigrating to a 43-44% number of people that were actually selling up and moving to another province. Um, and we saw that specifically within the Western Cape, um, that we saw kind of a, a big influx of people of that percentage moving into the Western Cape. And we found that the majority of people were actually leaving Gauteng. So it was almost like a move to a different part. Um, KZN, quite interesting, the stayed very um, it didn't really have a fluctuation. The two big province differences that we saw were specifically Gauteng and Western Cape. And I think once again, just to kind of reiterate what those numbers actually look like, because immigration is something that we, we look at, but it is tiny in the big, con the big view of the number of transfers happening. So if we look at 2021 as an example, there were over 200,000 trans transactions that happened that year in terms of property selling. And as an example, if we had to look at a Belito, 62 of those transactions was a semigration. So it's actually really quite small when we look at the total number of transactions happening. But if we look at towns for an example that we saw kind of an uptick we looked in KZN, we saw a little bit of an uptick towards the Margate. Margate actually came out highest. Um, then Kloof, which was quite interesting. Belito, Salt Rock next. Then on the Western Cape side, the biggest tick there was Muscle Bay. Um, and as a comparison, we saw of the 62 in Belito, Muscle Bay had 203. Um, so a bigger uptick, which is your Western Cape indication. Your Milnerton was kind of second. Um, then looking on your Eastern Cape side, your Jeffreys Bay, 159, um, and then PE, 179, which is also quite interesting. The other interesting aspect around semigration is also the age groups. So the biggest age group in semigration that we're seeing is your 46 and upwards. Um, generally, that's your biggest semigration. Those are kind of what we're seeing as people that are economically within their career, they can move they can decide where they're wanting to work, maybe making a, a change in a career as well. Um, the second age group featuring is a 36 to a 49. So that's kind of a bit of an overlap. And that's more kind of your, your family orientated, maybe looking for a different lifestyle for a family in terms of where you're wanting to reside. And then estate living preferred, once again, just to reiterate that, um, and just a note that we saw more people moving out of Gauteng than we've actually seen in previous years. So that was definitely the drive that we saw. Thanks so much for that. Some um, interesting facts there. Um, you know, when we used to see this influx of people going to Gauteng and, and now people moving away from, from the city. So, yeah, it's amazing to see how things and, 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 and life is changing. Um, Gemma, let's talk a little bit about, you know, technological trends. Um, we do know that companies need to be a lot more flexible. They need to be able to adapt quickly to some of these changes that we've been talking about. Maybe if we look specifically at the, you know, the sales platforms um, and what they look like, 
after, say, the 24 months of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, you know, the what have the online or auction sales platforms uh, looked like? What has been, you know, the role of of technology? And yeah, what are you finding in terms of um, of the traction that is in the marketplace, or 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 is this trend finding proper traction rather um, in the marketplace? Um, yes, I think it is finding traction in the market. Um, sort of going forward in terms of the recovery, we think that um, like in the commercial and industrial space, the next sort of 12 to 24 months are quite exciting and there could be quite a bit happening. So we have the view that the recovery began about 18 months ago for industrial um, and slightly more recently for commercial property. Um, certain commercial nodes will remain under pressure and they, they may be repurposing of existing buildings, but this can be very costly, especially sort of converting offices um, to residential sort of micro units that, that is very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, the initial post pandemic industrial stimulation in warehouses and e retailing um, for relevant properties was more reactive. However, this is now stabilizing to show long term rejuvenation and structural change. Whereas on the commercial side, the growth has been slow with no reactive elements at play, and this is more of a cautious approach. Um, these two patterns suggest that the next 12 to 24 months will be more predictable with no reactive drivers to consider compared to the last two years. Um, but then on the other hand, sort of recent externalities like the Eastern European conflict um, should be considered as economic impediments rather than drivers um, for structural market shifts. Um, and then sort of another big concern for us is unreliable power supply. And this is causing shifts in behavior and our users insist on backup power. Like we have found that in both the for offices and industrial space. Um, and for industrials, this is even more important because downtime is just not sustainable. Um, it's, yeah, it's very concerning. And then economic pressure and fuel price increases will also have not many effects on the property sector and the cost of staff traveling to work may need to become a consideration as well going forward. And then profit, profitability for industrial tenants as a result of economic pressures will also affect the rentals which can be achieved and thus values in turn. Um, another consideration is increasing operating costs, in particular rates and taxes and how this will affect the property sector. Um, we're finding it very much so that um, tenants are looking at the total cost of occupancy and, and a gross rental will be under pressure. So in some instances, the rental, the net rentals may be flat in the short term. But overall, we are optimistic about the next two years and um, there will be changes, but they, they are also exciting opportunities. Gemma, thank you so much for that. Uh, we saw, let me come back to you. Um, I know that there are a number of factors that, you know, would obviously impact real estate prices or the availability and investment potential. So uh, if we look, for example, we take four of these factors being your demographics, um, interest rates, the economy and uh, government policy. I just want to zone in um, on, the, on the last factor being government policy. Are you getting the sense that you know, our current government is doing enough to improve the the legislative conditions within the South African property market at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think that's almost a two part question. I think on the one hand it is, and I, I'll I'll get to the topic of sort of legislation, but I think um, to pick up on the last point that Gemma made was also just around um, you know rates and taxes and service delivery, and I think that has a very direct and tangible impact on um, sentiment around the property market in a particular region or even in the country at a national level. So, you know, um, property investors and or tenants are looking for a place that is clean, are looking for a place where there is service delivery, where there is um, reliable power supply and where those rates and taxes are being managed um, and billed accordingly. So that has a very big impact. On, on, on the vibrancy of the property market in a particular area. <clears throat> but coming back to your question on legislation in particular, there's a number of different pieces of legislation um, which you know have been in the kind of media and public domain recently. I mean, most recently, the, the rental housing regulations um, have been out of public comment. Um, and really the rental housing regulations, um, you know, being part of the Rental Housing Act, 
um, you know, just looks to strengthen the framework um, that governs the relationship between tenants and landlords. Um, so obviously anybody who is in the investment space and looking to be in that buy to let market and dealing with tenants would need to familiarize themselves with that. And I think there is a push to, to create more clarity and to create a much more transparent regulatory framework as far as um, uh, that relationship between tenants and landlords. Um, one of the areas, for example, that that will certainly be impacted is the informal housing market. Um, and, and that's quite interesting, you know, the informal uh, rental market, um, which is a segment that a huge chunk of our population um, is operating in, and they will now be required to to have lease agreements in place and, and tenants will have greater rights and be able to actually exercise their rights. Um, so that will certainly have an impact on the growth of that lower segment of the property se of, of the property market. Um, in terms of the other kind of key piece of legislation uh, being the Property Practitioners Act, uh, the focus there obviously is around regulating the behavior of property practitioners. Um, this has a, a, a serious impact, of course, on the on the trading environment. Um, you know, the buying and selling and letting. And a big focus of the Property Practitioners Act is around consumer protection. So uh, just making sure that, uh, particularly focusing on, on the use of trust funds and the rights attributable to consumers in the process of a transaction. And of course, also extending um, the regulatory power or authority um, over a, a, a greater group of people. So not just estate agents, but other players within the value chain who are involved or engaged in the business of buying and selling. And I think that certainly has a positive impact, you know, where there is much more regulatory clarity, um, legislative clarity, uh, the, 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 the industry um, is bound to function better and it makes for much more secure and sound um, investing. So there is um, there's, there's always a lot of work to be done and a lot of different moving parts. Um, and some, some pieces of legislation obviously have much more direct impact depending on where in the market uh, you, know, you play uh, or, or where your interests lie. So um, yeah, so I, I think there's, there's definitely a, a lot of impact on the property market and the, the manner in which government is able to implement and enforce the legislation, I think, is where the true test lies. Mm -hmm. Uh, implementation is key. That's yeah, uh, something that I think uh, has always been highlighted when it comes to government being able to put these plans into place as actually implementing them. But uh, like you said, at least there is something in the pipeline. There are things that are being uh, done. Um, hey, in the beginning of the conversation, I think maybe it was the, the second uh, answer to a question you you spoke a little bit about you know the different nodes um, and maybe where some of the opportunities are let me bring you back again just to get a sense of you know tell us a bit more about some of these pockets of opportunity within the residential sector um, you know does the old saying around location 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 still hold true um, yeah how can people cover out a new location and maybe w where are you finding uh, these particular spots to be uh, that are quite attractive to people at the moment thank you to me um, I think it is always about location 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 um, and I think it's around areas that have been doing well and continue to do well um, I think it becomes really important for buyers to be mindful in terms of areas and to understand information that is available when purchasing in, in areas to know that you're buying an investment that's going to reap your rewards. Just looking at some areas as an example, um, we saw, for instance, Bryanston as an example. We, we saw a drop in terms of the volume of transactions happening, but the interesting thing for me was 2020 to 2021, the average sale on those properties actually increased. It went from 1.5 million on average to 1.8 million, which is also an indication of a price increase in an area, which is also great. Bryanston is very diverse, so it offers everything from your sectional title to your, your freehold, um, which is your standalone house. Yeah. And obviously those ranges and prices are also broad. Your Val de V as another example that we're seeing is a is something that is spoken about a lot in terms of being an estate. Um, once again, we see one uptick there in terms of value of, of average prices. 
um, going from quarter four 2021, 3.3 million average up to 4.9 million early 2022. So definitely prices doing a bit of an increase in some of these areas. And then just looking at Belito as an example, again, I spoke about it briefly earlier, um, also an increase in average prices, 1.1 million to 1.5 million. Um, what we're seeing is obviously the pockets are down towards more your coastal areas. It's definitely a move that we're seeing where people are obviously preferring to purchase. Um, if you are looking to upscale, downgrade, upgrade, um, kind of also looking at predictions going forward and kind of how we are looking at this year and how it's going to pan out. We have a various a scale that we actually use in terms of predicting valuations on properties. And at a high end, we're looking at this year ending out at about 5% on average, which is your property inflation. Um, 3.8 is kind of your middle road, which is probably where we're going to be ending, and the lower end at 2.5. So it will be interesting to understand the impact of the interest rates and possible further hikes in the year, which I'm anticipating that we will be having. And obviously that will also impact some, some level of buying. Um, on the rental side, however, it is encouraging. Um, the rental market obviously went through a bit of a dip as soon as the buying market picked up due to the, the interest rates and the availability to purchase a property. We saw rental markets take a bit of a, a dive. However, now that's starting to swing and change again. So once again, rental, your buyer to rent market is going to be picking up, um, which is also a great opportunity then to look for those properties that you're wanting to buy to let. Um, Hayley, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, it will be very interesting to see how increases in, you know, in interest rates is going to filter through. Um, Gemma, let me bring you in and maybe just also get a sense from you about, you know, what the recovery looks like or what the commercial and industrial property landscape is going to look like in, say, the next uh, 12 to 24 months. What are the key things you are looking out for uh, and things we should be mindful of? Um, I think I have mentioned some of this previously, but I think, um, like, we are excited about what the future holds, and I think um, there will be pockets of opportunity. We, we are concerned about um, ESCOM supply, um, and the impact that's going to have on on the property sector, and then also sort of other economic pressures and the Eastern European conflict. Uh, those all have a uh, sort of the sector. And then, um, as Brisa also, also mentioned, the um, the rates and taxes and operating costs like that is very concerning, and and it is going to have an impact. Although, like for landlords, the total operating costs need to be considered together with the net rent because t tenants are very much looking at the total cost of occupancy. But I think going forward, um, the, the market is exciting and yeah, we are very optimistic about what the future holds. Um, Gemma, just to maybe put you on the spot, we've had a, um, a question that's come in from one of our audience members, um, hoping that the, you'd be able to assist with this particular one. Uh, and it just reads, good day, what are your views on commercial property now that we're seeing many companies uh, that have moved to uh, move from work to a hybrid? Uh, so in other words, needing lesser property space and rental space. Do you see rental prices going down uh, or those building converting to be used uh, for other uses? Um, yes, I think um, th there definitely is a shift towards hybrid working, and I think that in itself is quite exciting. And the the demand for office space will continue to remain. Um, and I think sort of smaller offices may be required in um, areas closer to residential areas. Like that um, is a trend that we're seeing. And then also um, the the, um, it will put pressure on rentals, and the rentals may be flat for for some time. Um, but I think also the, the the human element is still very important, and you can't build a company culture virtually. Um, and knowledge and sort of the skills transfer is very difficult on a virtual platform. So it, for the older, more established um, working people, it's easier. But for, for new graduates, it's very difficult to sort of learn the ropes and 
where do you get stuck in um, through a virtual platform? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, we saw we also have a question that came through from um, one of the audience members, uh, and it was specifically around the prospects of student accommodation. Uh, especially for small players, uh, a couple of privately owned units or houses. Um, it says COVID severely impacted the demand and the holding out for the students to come back is becoming too expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this the new normal? Will student accommodation really bounce back anytime soon? Uh, have you saw your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think similarly to to the to what we saw in the office market, you know, COVID had a severe impact on the physical presence of students um, in institutions. So, um, you know, there there was there was certainly some difficulty in that segment of the market, but we are seeing that turning around. People are returning to campuses, um, and and again for that for the younger you know generation for students that physical interaction is critical. It's so critical. So yes, there is um, you know, a rise of people being able to do even hybrid learning, but the role of being on campus, the role of being um, in those shared accommodations is critical. The other element is a lot of students live out of the, the cities where they actually learn. So there's still going to be a, a strong demand for student accommodation. I think as a, as a tenant, I mean, as a landlord, particularly as an emerging landlord, um, one just needs to be aware of that. I mean, even in a in a regular market under regular market conditions, um, one of the risk factors of student accommodation is indeed the fact that you know universities are closed for three months of the year. So one has to manage their cash flows and 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 model their their um, their, their you know their uh, student accommodation investment portfolio accordingly and ensure that there is a, a, a solution to managing those cash flows. What we've also seen, especially with the smaller um, landlords, is the ability to repurpose uh, some of that accommodation in the, you know, during the, the periods where it's not uh, occupied by students. Some people are actually able to repurpose for short-term accommodation, maybe to sort of holiday makers, backpackers, et cetera. So I think the key is, is, is in that innovation. It's in recognizing the, um, the fluidity of that market and making sure that you build that into your model. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much um, for that. Um, I think I'm just going to ask any one of you ladies just to, you know, to come in and give, you, give us your sense um, about how you read the situation um, in, in KZN. Obviously, uh, there was huge loss of life, which has been very unfortunate uh, last year. I think we saw you mentioned we had uh, the riots that took place and then uh, this year we've had the floods. Uh, just your sense on, you know, what your take is, what's happening in, in Mshanga, but also I just think the KZN property market in general, um, I can, you know, take it one at a time or maybe any one of you would like to um, to take this, this particular question. Uh, Hayley? Let, let me jump in. Um, I think it's actually probably a bit too early to get a good sense in terms of the impact on the property, the property market. I think from an infrastructure point of view, I think that's going to take a while to um, fix what's been damaged. It's really been a terrible time for, for KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and I think the effect we'll probably realize in the next couple of months to maybe a year, even more. Um, I think the damage to the roads um, and all of those infrastructure pieces is going to take a long time to repair. Um, so it will be it will be interesting to kind of follow and keep tabs in terms of what's happening. It's certainly not stopping some level of development. There's still quite a bit of development happening up the north coast. Um, so that is not tempered at this point. Um, however, I know that in certain areas, water has been disrupted. There's been disruption to electricity. So it is it is a trying time in KwaZulu-Natal, and I think it's going to take time to understand the full effect. Yeah. Um, we, so I think I may have uh, uh, cut you off before Hayley came in. Did you um, want to comment on that? Uh, no, but uh, well, now that I have the mic, <laughs> I will maybe just add to that and, and kind of maybe reflect on the commercial the commercial sector. I mean, last last year's uh, riots 
as I mentioned, um, you know, had a, a very, you know, destructive impact and, and, and far reaching effect on the commercial sector, which um, fortunately was mitigated by, you know, the, the, the CESRIA insurance and, and people being able to actually uh, make those claims and, and, and um, you know, <clears throat> start the rebuilding process. But I think to Haley's point, it is going to be about um, the speed with which government is able to reinvest in that infrastructure. I think from a property sector perspective, the risk has largely been mitigated and the damage has largely been mitigated. And, and, and there's a process of rebuilding now. And, um, you know, but I think um, it is going to boil down to to that to the speed at which that infrastructure is reconstructed and, and how soon the market in general is able to bounce back. And that speaks to, you know, that has impact across retail as an asset class across um, um, industrial, commercial, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Misa. Um, Jim, I'd like to bring you in here, maybe uh, just changing tact here. Um, this, you know, what I'd like to ask you looks specifically at um, the valuation of your property. So maybe are you able to talk to us about, you know, what impacts the valuation of your so how can you manage these factors to improve the value of your commercial property or your industrial uh, property or even to access funding? Um, yeah, so various factors influence valuation of property. So I'll just mention a couple of points now. Um, net income is a key driver for commercial and industrial property. So understanding the inputs in terms of revenue, recoveries and expenses is so important. We spend a lot of time understanding contractual revenue versus market norms and also interrogating the expenses. And then on, a, on another point, um, often a simple aspect which is overlooked is regular maintenance. And this is fundamental in maintaining value and value improvements are more difficult to achieve if, if a property is not maintained. It's quite easy to think of a building only from an asset management view, but one may forget that they, they are still real bricks and mortar. And this is especially true for industrial property. And then another point that we um, find quite a lot at the moment when we inspect properties is that the fire safety equipment hasn't been serviced for years. And this is a requirement of, that we have to report to the bank. Um, so just a reminder to everyone listening to ensure that all necessary fire equipment is serviced annually. And then um, commercial property is highly sensitive to market forces, um, whereas industrial property may be less to a lesser degree. Um, and the, the link between the physical building characteristics, tenants requirements, and possible profitability of a tenant's operations are arguably stronger when it comes to industrial buildings versus commercial office spaces. Perhaps a reason why the office space may be more sensitive to market externalities is, the, is there's more of a disconnect between what is happening inside the office building and its revenue potential. And then just in terms of access to funding, in general, this is affected by market forces as they assist in determining variables such as affordability, risk profile and returns. It is appropriate to say that the role valuations play in providing access to funding is also direct, as valuations typically represent a value on the open market. So market forces and valuations are inextricably linked when providing access to funding. So valuations focus on many different aspects and we try to take quite a holistic view when we're looking at each property. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Gemma. Um, let's uh, go back to Vuye. So, um, I think in the beginning I mentioned how, you know, when we had the, the start of the pandemic, um, jobs were lost. We, uh, we saw um, a lot of buildings being empty and we also saw how the stock market came under pressure. Um, but property, um, you know, over the last year or so has certainly, or the listed property sector in South Africa uh, has certainly showed some recovery. Uh, would you say that this would now be a good time to invest when it comes to listed property on the stock exchange? Yeah, um, so I would say that, um, and, and to your point, the listed property sector has seen um, some recovery um, it's been it's been a challenging time for the listed property sector actually over the last three to five years, um, notwithstanding even some of the more recent events that have caused you know um, immediate shocks to the sector. But I think overall <clears throat> the sector is on a path to recovery. 
Um, and if you're looking at it at a holistic level, then um, you know there is positive. There's there's positive sentiment, and the se the, the sector is on a path to recovery. So. It could certainly be a good time for someone who is looking to invest in the sector, but I would say um, it's it's very important when looking at uh, you know listed property stocks to also understand the underlying um, asset class and what impacts that subsector. So um, it's certainly my preference to have a better understanding of what that actual company does um, and where are they invested and how is their portfolio actually weighted. Because um, as we've heard from the various speakers around the table, you know, there is no kind of, you know, different different sub asset classes are impacted, you know, vastly differently by different economic shocks. So I think that that second level of analysis is is probably where the answer lies. Um, and as we're saying, if you look at funds that are more focused on on the more resilient um, subclasses like logistics, um, you know, township rural retail, for example, those are areas that have been um, surprisingly uh, resilient and also been good performers over the last couple of years, but others perhaps not. So I think one needs to really look at it at a, at a, at a, at a fund by fund level. Um, I have a question here that's come through from um, the audience. And um, again, please feel free, any one of you are happy to, to jump in. Um, but it's specifically around office space. And they're wanting to know if the, if the reversion of office space is permanent or if we're going to see the return to normal office space uh, use over the long term. Um, and then I think that if, so that would be the one question specifically looking at the office space. I think Gemma may actually have already touched on that. Um, but then moving on to the residential sector, maybe Haley, you could come in, uh, is where's the most activity in the residential space? Uh, in other words, which segment? I'm not sure if maybe you've already alluded to this uh, when you were talking about uh, the different regions and where people are finding a lot of opportunity, but maybe we can also use this um, as a time for you to to bring in your closing thoughts and maybe pick up on one or, or two of these questions that um, that I've put forward. So maybe uh, Haley, if you would be able to give us a closing remark and 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 if you'd like to elaborate a little bit more based on the question um, that I've just posed now. Great, thank you, Tumi. Um, just jumping straight into kind of the question to understand where the most activity is happening. Um, we actually see a lot of acti activity happening on the lower end of the, the property market. So anything kind of under your 700, 800,000 rand of uh, worth of property is definitely kind of where the transactions are happening. Um, so that is where we see most activity. And that is a general, that is a continual trend that really hasn't changed um, for decades, really. So um, that's continually where we're going to find just bear in mind also, obviously, those kind of values in terms of where we're talking the, the lower value also is pertinent to your smaller towns. So your smaller towns properties are not at the values of your metropolitan areas. So you're going to see where people are semigrating. You're going to see that activity as well. But also just in terms of closing, um, the residential property market has been very strong and we've seen it being very strong for the last two years and it is still strong. Uh, property is still a good investment. It's always a long term investment. Um, and I think now is still a good time to invest. Interest rates are still low. We are anticipating more higher interest rates through the year, but it's still very much affordable. Um, through the year, I think we're going to be looking at how the consumer is impacted. Um, it's not just interest rates, it's obviously fuel increases, the impact on electricity, how does that all boil down? But from a property perspective in terms of interest and lending, it's a really good time to purchase a property. Well, thank you for that, um, Hayley. Gemma, let's get your closing comments. I think um, in the commercial and industrial space, we are excited about what the future holds. I think there will be changes in the office sector, um, just sort of as habits change. But I think the, the demand remains there and to some extent people will go back to the office. Um, the industrial sector, as I mentioned before, we are very concerned about the impact of unreliable power um, and that is going to definitely have an impact on the industrial sector. But yeah, going forward, we are excited about to see where the market goes. 
Thanks, Gemma. Uh, we saw last, but certainly not least, some of the closing comments from you, please. Um, yeah, so I think as a whole, as a country, there are so many moving parts right now, and um, that has a direct impact, and you see it playing out in our property market, and, and Haley touched on the, the kind of the, the activity in that lower segment, and I think the key thing is that, um, you know, we are seeing um, a lot of new first-time buyers still coming into the market the growth of first time buyers coming into the market. We are seeing um, ownership, property ownership is also um, growing amongst younger people and awareness of the importance of property investing and ownership. So there's certainly a lot of activity and people who are climbing onto that property ladder, whether at a residential level or even at a commercial property investment level. Um, there's a number of different platforms and ways that people can invest into commercial property without needing to be subject matter experts per se. So, you know, investing through fractional ownership schemes, investing as groups, as stock fells, as whatever it may be. And I think that's really exciting for me. Um, and, and as I said earlier, you know, it's it is a long game. Um, there are constant market activities and market shocks, ups and downs. The key thing is to understand the people that underpin the property that you are invested in and to understand how they then would be affected by those market shocks and, and be able to, to react um, accordingly, but, um, but always taking a long-term view. So again, very optimistic about the sector. Uh, property is not going anywhere. People will always need to live somewhere. They will always need to shop somewhere. They will always need to work somewhere. Um, there may be shifts in how they use space, but space will always be required. And so it is, it's certainly still a good um, asset class to invest into. Well, uh, ladies, I certainly do think that is a very good place to leave it. Um, I thank you very much for your time this morning and sharing your insights and we were able to, you know, get some more in-depth information on the residential sector with Hayley, uh, Gemma, in terms of the commercial property and industrial uh, sector. Thank you for your insights, Wieswa. Uh, thank you for giving us the lay of the land in terms of what you're seeing uh, on a whole and bringing in the, you know, the macroeconomic environment into play as well. Um, so that's where we leave it in terms of this discussion again it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to get these insights from our panel uh, that's it from me i'm going to be handing back over to kashif kashif thank you so much uh, to me whilst i mean thoroughly enjoyed being the thorn amongst the roses today all good things must come to an end unfortunately um, in the next few days we will be sending an invitation to one of our smaller more interactive sessions um, on the topic, SA property valuations, financing and yields, uh, and that will have specialist insights to help you achieve your goals. Uh, this will take place next Thursday on the, sorry, the following Thursday on the 9th of June at, at 10 a.m. So guys, please keep a lookout for those invites. Um, I think just lastly, your views do matter to us um, as clients. Uh, please help us to improve our future webinars by giving us your feedback. It's critical for us as a business to understand this um, and to get as much feedback from our clients as possible. So on your screen, we have displayed a QR code with a step-by-step -step guideline on how to access the survey. Scan the QR code on the side to link up to the survey. Then use the camera on your phone to scan the QR code. Once it's scanned, a link will pop up uh, and you can then fulfill the survey and click on the submit button. Uh, just from a NetBank private wealth perspective, um, we are very much open to doing business from a lending perspective across the residential all the way to the commercial side of things. Uh, we look at everything from vanilla mortgage type loans um, to the more bespoke and complex structured lending type facilities. Um, but everything across the sun, uh, we're able to cater for. So please reach out to us. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of NetBank Wealth Management South Africa, thank you and goodbye.